Well, good morning, everyone. It's a joy to see you all. And I'm particularly glad to be reunited with Jeremy and the family again. Well, if you'd like to turn once again to Daniel chapter 5. Two sons are born to the same Christian parents. They share the same DNA. They emerge from the same womb, live in the same home, hear the same prayers at bedtime, are taken to the same church and listen to the same sermons. One becomes a missionary and the other goes to prison. This sort of scenario is not as far-fetched as it might seem. No doubt you have friends who attended the same youth group that you did, but who are now in a spiritual wilderness. It's common enough for a sermon which triggers off a spiritual earthquake in the heart of one man to bounce off the cranium of another. These experiences are pointed reminders of a somber truth, which is that the gospel divides people. It drives a chasm between them. To some, it's the message of salvation. To others, it is the announcement of irrevocable doom. To the one, says the Apostle Paul, we are the aroma of death, leading to death, and to others, the aroma of life, leading to life. 2 Corinthians 2, verse 16. The contrasting stories of Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar are an Old Testament case study of the same principle in action. I want to begin with our first heading, and it's this, how to make a drunk sober. What is the best way to make a drunkard sober? Well, some would favor a bucket of cold water over the head. Others prefer lashings of strong black coffee. But the story before us shows a different approach altogether. Many years have passed since the events recorded in chapter 4, which, as it happens, I preached on here some time ago. They're to do with the dream and the madness and the subsequent restoration of King Nebuchadnezzar. A number of changes had occurred following the death of that human colossus. His son, who in English translations of the Bible is called Evil Merodach, now it doesn't mean he was an evil man, it's just an attempt to get his Babylonian name rendered into syllables in the English language, well, he'd not retained his father's throne for very long. A succession of short reigns followed until a man whose name was Nabonidus was able to bring about a measure of stability to the Babylonian throne. And having consolidated his power, Nabonidus spent 10 years in Arabia. Now, it seems likely that the reason for that is that he was engaged in an extended military campaign in that part of the world, wanting to stabilize his western frontier. But there's also a suggestion in some of the ancient chronicles that he was the victim of a terrible disease and that he was spending time in that region of the world in quarantine, away 
from the heartlands of his empire. And this is where Belshazzar enters the picture. He was the son of this man, Nabonidus, and was installed as his father's deputy to rule in his absence. And while his father was away, Belshazzar was king in all but name. And apart from one or two ceremonial functions, which could be performed by no one but the reigning monarch himself, he exercised all the powers of kingship. And that, incidentally, is why Belshazzar could offer Daniel only the third place in the kingdom when the time came to give him some reward for his remarkable service. Now, the scene before us this morning is a great banquet. The creme de la creme of Babylonian society was out in force. It ought to have been a great moment for Belshazzar, presiding over one of the great social events in the calendar. Unless you were there, and unless you were seen to be there, you were a nobody. And this great assembly of somebodies, Belshazzar himself was the focus of all attention. Every eye was on him, and yet even as he threw the biggest party of the year, even as he lapped up the adulation of the VIPs, events were unfolding which would turn his night of triumph into a massive personal disaster. Working under the cover of night, Persian troops were hard at work. The Persian emperor, Darius, had sent one of his crack generals, a man named Gubaru, to seize the city. And even as the revelers wallowed in an ocean of drink inside walls that they confidently supposed to be impregnable, the Persians were about to pull off a masterstroke of siegecraft. And in the meantime, as the celebrations wore on, Belshazzar was in a mood of reckless confidence. Now, there's no doubt that this ocean of alcohol was a contributory factor. Until quite recently, there was a common perception that evangelical Christianity and teetotalism went hand in hand. I think this situation had arisen largely for historical reasons, but the outcome was unfortunate. It created in a great many minds, both inside and outside the Church of Jesus Christ, a mistake about the essence of the gospel. It introduced an element of works righteousness into the thinking of many fine Christians. Now, total abstention from alcohol is a matter of personal choice. It's not a biblical given. But once that point has been made, it's certainly clear that Scripture condemns drunkenness roundly and often. It involves abdicating our humanity for a time, sidestepping responsibility for our own actions. And no doubt the fact that Belshazzar was no longer in control of himself led on to the critical moment here around which the whole story turns. Many years before, during the reign of his ancestor Nebuchadnezzar, the sacred vessels, which had once been used in the temple at Jerusalem, had been brought back to Babylon as part of the spoils of war. And now the drunken monarch ordered these vessels to be brought into the banqueting hall so that he and his guests could offer libations to the gods of Babylon and then drink from them themselves. Now, at this point, most pagans would have recoiled from horror at what he was proposing. 
the very thought of drinking from a chalice that was sacred to a particular god could well incur the severe displeasure of the god in question. Why run such a foolhardy risk? It seems, however, that Belshazzar was supreme in his arrogant self-confidence. The God of Israel was no longer a force to be reckoned with, he thought. His temple was in ruins. He'd not been able to prevent his holy things being seized and carted off to Babylon as booty. So Belshazzar figured that he had nothing to worry about from that quarter. A few chief, cheap sorry, jibes at the expense of that god would help his party go with a swing. And it was just at that moment, just as the king and his inebriated guests swigged from the holy goblets and called out their raucous praises to the deities of Babylon, that part of a human hand could be seen writing four enigmatic characters on the wall behind the high table where Belshazzar sat. Now let me just say at this point that God still has his holy things. His Bible, his table, his churches, even his ministers. To neglect them, to scorn them, is to run a fearful risk. Our second heading, Daniel comes out of retirement. I'm sure you know the score. When a leading football club acquires a new manager, it's quite common for the new man to bring his team of assistants along with him. The coach, the physiotherapist, and so on. In the same way, it seems that the regimes which had followed that of Nebuchadnezzar had put their own administrations in place. Which means that Daniel, who had been so prominent in Nebuchadnezzar's day, had been sidelined since that time. And in any case, he was now a very old man. So the queen, verse 10, she, however, had remembered Daniel. And as she was not originally at the banquet, but came in response to all the disturbance that followed when this hand wrote the characters on the wall, this lady was probably not Belshazzar's consort, but rather the Queen Mother, remembered from Nebuchadnezzar's day. And the exchange that followed between Daniel and Belshazzar is very different from the conversations that took place between Nebuchadnezzar and Daniel when he had been a much younger man, and when Daniel used to speak respectfully to Nebuchadnezzar. There's nothing of that sort of tone between Daniel and Belshazzar. There's no expression of regret about the fate that was about to fall upon Belshazzar. Compare, for instance, the words here with the words in chapter 4 and verse 19. There's no suggestion that repentance might bring a stay of execution, which you find in chapter 4 between Daniel and Nebuchadnezzar. It's as though a deep chasm separates these two men. The old prophet spurned the king's offer of fabulous wealth. You can keep your treasure. Let your rewards be for another. Instead, his whole manner was like that of a judge passing sentence. John Betjeman the late poet laureate, once wrote a poem about a middle-aged couple traveling home on the bus after a visit to Harley Street. The husband had been to see a specialist. 
The wife was trying her best, but for all her tenderness, the journey was punctuated by waves of despair. No hope, the doctor had said. Belshazzar now had no hope of a reprieve. The voice of the prophet was like the voice of God in Jesus' story of the rich fool. This very night your soul will be required of you. Moments before, he had reveled in a wild orgy, and now, ashen-faced, as the assembled aristocracy of Babylon looked on aghast at the man, he learned his fate. The party was well and truly over. It gives me no comfort to consider, whenever I preach this sermon that some who are listening to me might leave this world only to hear a similar verdict, no hope of a secure or a happy eternity, no hope of the forgiveness and love of Jesus, no hope of blessedness, no hope of heaven, no hope at all. My next heading is this. When God's patience runs out. The four letters on the wall represented, on the one hand, coins, and on the other hand, weights and measures. Coins, you see, were not in regular use yet in every part of the world. In effect, the writing said this, Amina, Amina, a shekel, and a parsin. But a parsin meant one half. So it's not clear whether it meant half a shekel or half a mina. Now in the former case, if we put it in modern English values, it could be a pound, a pound, tuppence, and a penny. Or in the second case, it would be a pound, a pound, tuppence, and 50 pence. Whatever could this mean? Well, Daniel quickly saw that each word was a pun. They could be read as verbs, as action words, as well as units of money. Numbered, numbered, weighed, and divided in two. The fourth word, parsing, was a pun on two levels. It was very close to the name of Persia. But what a verdict on a human life. Verse 27. You've been weighed in balances and found wanting. Or to put it more bluntly, measured against the standards that God sets, you've been found inadequate. You're completely and utterly inadequate. Does that kind of talk make you feel uneasy? Do you have the suspicion that inside a lot of people there might be a little Belshazzar? Now, don't be tempted to make excuses for the monarch. We mustn't minimise the affront to Almighty God involved in using the vessels from his temple to pay honour to lifeless statues or to have fun boozing from them. And even so, it's not as if Belshazzar was in trouble for one rash act in an otherwise blameless life. That's not the way it worked. He'd been given a whole lifetime in which to make his peace with God. 
and he had been given a whole lifetime in which to have a good look at what had happened to Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel began his conversation with Belshazzar by giving him a review of Nebuchadnezzar's life. Look at verses 18 to 20. Belshazzar had seen his illustrious ancestor at close quarters and had seen the dramatic change that had taken place late on in his life, the sudden fall from a life of magnificence and eminence to the life of a madman who thinks that he's a cow. wandering around the paddock on all fours, mooing like an ox. And Belshazzar had also seen the way that God had restored sanity so that Nebuchadnezzar was brought round to a delighted acceptance that as great as his kingdom had been, he himself was like putty in the hands of God who moves the minds and wills of men as he pleases. Belshazzar had a grandstand seat as a life was turned upside down by the grace of God. And this is why the prophet's words in verse 22 are so withering. But you, his son Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, although you knew all this. He'd refused to recognize the obvious and stubbornly closed his mind to the grace of God. The incident with the sacred vessels, you see, was simply the last and worst act of defiance of God in a lifetime made up of similar acts of defiance. And Belshazzar is not alone. There's many a family in England where they've seen a life turned round, where they've witnessed something similar to what happened to Nebuchadnezzar, where a life has been radically altered by the intervention of God's Holy Spirit. I knew a man for a good many years, although he's in heaven now, who grew up in what you might call a dysfunctional family. His mother was a Christian lady, but his father was a drunken boer who talked with his fists. And one day his father woke up from sleep, having gone to bed, in a drunken stupor and I'd, I'd better not tell you what his father said because he grew up in a part of the world where they speak a dialect that you folks would not understand. He grew up in the same town as me incidentally but um, basically he said um, to his wife, Bella, I'm going to the mission the little evangelical church that his wife used to attend. And she was in such despair living with this man that she said, well, I hope it falls on you. And remarkably, he was wonderfully converted when he got there. But friends, that doesn't always happen. It doesn't always happen that a drunken boer who talks with his fists becomes a responsible husband. A flighty teenager has become an impressive young woman with the inner dignity and beauty that only the grace of God can bestow. A husband now has a new wife. Just what has made an irresponsible lout into an affectionate son and a dependable employee? Now, in some homes where this miracle happens, they learn the obvious lesson. They say to themselves, 
what has changed my loved one? They seek the mercy of God and are also changed by his power. But in other homes, what you might call the Belshazzar syndrome comes to the fore, and in spite of irrefutable evidence before their own eyes that the gospel makes a difference, parents, brothers, sisters, aunts and uncles, they just treat God with contempt. Well, as you can see from our passage, the end came soon for Belshazzar. The western side of Babylon was guarded by an arm of the mighty river Euphrates, a barrier too wide for any siege train to cross. But during the night, Persian military engineers had actually succeeded in diverting the river into an old drainage channel. And the Persian troops walked across the riverbed, almost dry shod, took possession of the city in a bloodless coup, and the citizens welcomed them with cheering, which says something for the popularity of Belshazzar, doesn't it? And there's a sobering lesson behind all this. It is possible, friends, to exhaust the patience of God. Belshazzar had crossed an invisible line. For him, the situation had become irretrievable. Now compare him with his predecessor, Nebuchadnezzar. What it means is the two tyrants lived without God. Each of them had a vision. And each one had been left shaken to the core. One of the two became a trophy of God's grace. The other was lost. On the one hand, the explanation lies in the overarching sovereignty of God, who hardens whom he wills and pardons whom he pleases. But equally, that sovereignty works itself out in the aggregate of a lifetime's choices. In seeing the experience of Nebuchadnezzar at first hand, Belshazzar had privileges that other people don't enjoy. He willfully chose to ignore the lessons he should have learned and confirmed that choice again and again as his life became set in a habit of defying God. Jesus once told a parable about a fig tree. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. Then he said to the keeper of his vineyard, look, for three years I've come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down. Why does it use up the ground? But he answered and said to him, sir, let it alone this year also until I dig it around and fertilize it. And if it bears fruit, well, but if not, after that, you can cut it down. The farmer had a right to expect some figs from his fig tree. He put up with it for years. Time and effort were expended on the unproductive tree. It was well watered and manured. Now, given that he'd waited years in the entirely reasonable expectation of figs, who could blame the farmer for setting a time limit? I'll give it one more year, he thought. Now God does just the same with human souls. They hear the same gospel that others hear, without any softening of the heart. Years pass by, and then at a time known only to God, he regretfully leaves them to their own willfulness. The hidden boundaries crossed, the position becomes irretrievable. Please, make shutting your ears to the voice of God a habit and you'll become willful to it, you'll become deaf to it through your own choice. Let me ask, have you, be have you been walking away from God? If so, please retrace your steps before you've gone past the point of no return. <laughs> 